guys, I'm sorry about Hey guys, I'm sorry about that. Um Yeah, so I tried to do something and then that happened. So and then it just ended up ending. So uh this is um yeah, let's just continue where we were. He was talking about color awareness. And um yeah, now it's all weird. Let me make sure the sound is good. Mm -hmm. Sound, sound. Uh, sound, sound. All right, there we go. All Gucci. And back to task. Thank you guys for rejoining. <laughs> All right, back to color awareness. And when that hits one hour, of course, we're going to add like 10 or so minutes or however long that took. Okay, so. Key, the sound of the piece does change. And if you have noticed anything like this, then this is color awareness. This is the basic ability of perfect pitch in its infant stage. It's very much like a child when he's first learning his visual colors. Maybe at first, he's got color awareness. He does see the colors but he confuses the colors. He's, he might look at red and say orange because he hasn't yet matured enough to be able to tell the two apart. But he's got color awareness. Later on though, he learns to discriminate. That's yellow, that's orange, and that's red. And that becomes color discrimination. And that's our level number two, the ability to discriminate between these colors. So that if I play this, you can tell it's A. Or if I play this, you can tell it's G major. Now, this is true perfect pitch, this level number two. You can discriminate among all 12, 12 chromatic pitch colors. The word chromatic means colored. The chromatic scale here, the colored scale. Everyone has its own different color sound. And what do these color sounds sound like? This is the big question now. I'm sure you're all asking. You're all waiting to find out what these sounds are all about here. I'm going to tell you the secret behind developing perfect pitch now. And it is so ridiculously simple that when I tell it to you, many of you are going to say, oh, come on. Is that all there is to it? Well, the thing is, perfect pitch is just one of the natural abilities of the ear. So it's got to be naturally simple and easy. It's nothing complicated. It's a part of our own perception. And it's just this. Here I have a tone, and here I have another tone. Now what do you hear that's different about these tones? Well, obviously one is higher and one is lower. That's what everybody hears. That's relative pitch, hearing that one is higher and one is lower. That's okay. how they relate to each other. Mm. But can we hear anything else that's different about these two tones? Well, this top tone, this F sharp, has a kind of a twangy feeling to it. Whereas this E flat, this bottom tone, has a softer, more mellow sound to it. Top one? Vibrant, twangy. And the lower one? The E flat? Sounds softer and more mellow. These are the pitch colors of these two tones. And if you listen very carefully, you will be able to hear this. Let's listen again to this F sharp here. It has a vibrant kind of a sound to it. It kind of goes like this. Like that. And the E flat kind of goes wah, wah, wah. Like that. It's a different quality of sound. Now, at first, you will hear these sounds probably only on your own live instrument. Don't think you're going to hear it necessarily even on this tape. 
And don't think you're going to hear it on other instruments, but on your own instrument, on your guitar if you're a guitarist, or on the piano if you're a pianist, whatever your instrument is. Piano, I think, is also a lot easier to hear for many people because it's a very common instrument. I think guitar is pretty easy, too. But your own instrument is going to be the best. Every single tone in the chromatic scale has its own color sound. We hear that the pitch is rising. At the same time, every one of these has its own quality to it, which is its own sound color. The F sharp is vibrant, where, 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 like that. And the E flat is wah, wah, wah. The A flat is also a kind of a soft one, but it's a different kind of mellowness than the E flat. These are the absolute pitch colors, and this is what perfect pitch is all about. It's not a matter of figuring out how high or low the note is. Some people think that if you have perfect pitch and you play this note, you kind of just register how high is it. Well, it's an A. No, no, this isn't it at all. The A has a certain sound to it. It's not really twangy and it's not really mellow. It's very difficult to describe. It's a certain quality. It's like describing visual colors. Red is a vibrant visual color. Blue is a more sedate color. Well, what's green? Well, how do you describe green? It's very difficult. It's kind of growy. I don't know. It's alive or something. And yellow is different. It's the same with sound. What I'd like you to do is go to your own instrument right now and have a listen. Hear for yourself that these color sounds do exist. And remember, for the instrumentalists, we have to use concert pitches of these tones. If you are a trumpet player and it's a B-flat trumpet, then the tones you're going to be listening for are G-sharp and F on your trumpet. The G-sharp is going to be the twangy one. It doesn't make any difference what we call these tones. What makes a difference is its absolute pitch. So we'll break now, and when you've had a listen, we'll continue with our master class. Um, so yeah, so right now, I would love to play my guitar, but it needs to be um, taken into Guitar Center to be fixed because it got hurt on one of my trips. Um, on my last trip in March, uh, the last time I could travel. Um, so it got hurt, and I haven't been able to take it into Guitar Center because all the repair ones are closed, at least here in Maryland. So they're all closed, so I can't take it in to get it fixed. So I haven't been able to get it fixed. And it took me still like a month or two to realize it. Uh, well, my dresser was still like over there. Um, so like, yeah, and my ukulele I left in upstate New York um because i was, thought i was going to be going back and forth like a lot that kind of thing and i wanted to uh be able to you know not carry so much stuff back and forth with me on the like the two-day trip so um yeah so i don't actually have an instrument to really play now i have my um my little uh my little drum that i could play but once again you know that has like basically three basic sounds i can probably get more I think it has, it actually has all the songs of piano, sounds of piano, if you know how to play it. Um, I could do my own voice as an instrument, but one, I just had oral surgery, and two, I don't really know like all the different tones, so we're just gonna continue on with the lesson. With that in mind, that I don't really have a good instrument to like um, do what he's talking about, not until I can get my guitar fixed. So she's right over there, just waiting till we can take her in. Which, you know, it's the never ending. Well, I mean, it's going to end. Nothing is never, never end. Nothing is, yeah. The only thing that's never ending is never ending. Anyways. As a reminder, David Lucas suggests that you now take a break and continue fresh tomorrow. We're not even an hour in yet, though. Okay. Well, we do want to follow what he's saying. So, we've got this, uh, we've got the relative pitch training. So, we know we're at track three with this, right? 
So we're at track three. So I'll include that here. Um, so yeah. He's saying take a break, continue tomorrow. Let's just make sure. And then we'll just go on to some relative fish training because we got this, um, you know, um, a uh, what's it called the sample audio CD. So we'll just go to that one. Oh yeah, I think there was only two on this one, right? Can I pass forward here? Mm. So we're just gonna go into relative ear training now. He wants us to take a break. Okay. Oh yeah, so this is only one and two. I don't know, we might start with two again just because I'm not really sure if it was finished or not. I think it was, but I'm not sure. Well, this time when he says, um, so we'll just do like the same basic thing tomorrow kind of, except without this bre weird break in the middle that we already kind of did. <laughs> so we already kind of took a break. And uh, yeah, so let's see. So this one comes with this thing, the relative pitch training one, comes with this. It's a chord chart for the relative pitch training course. Um, so we get the lesson number one in there. Elements of music is only part of your development. So there's there's no little booklet for us to do, nothing to like fill out or anything like that. But so we got this, so I'm sure it'll come in handy. So yeah, we're gonna work on the relative picture if we're supposed to take a break, even though we kind of did. If it had just been a little bit longer until the uh thing. Okay, here we go. Classic. Debut album. What is it? I'm on you. Sunny days. Ear training. Dot com. Pitch Air Training Super Course. Lesson One, Part One. Ladies and gentlemen, David Lucas Burge. Relative pitch, like perfect pitch, is an aspect of our own musical awareness. It's not something outside of ourselves. Let me show you. If we have a C and a G, now together they form a certain relationship one with another. We call this a perfect fifth. It has a certain sound to it. It's different than if I make a C and a B. It has a different sound to it. Now, really, these sounds are all in our own mind. In a sense, they're a little bit illusory because they don't really exist anywhere except in our own mind, in our own awareness. Because this C is sitting right here. 
just minding its own business, and the G is sitting here minding its own business, and neither one of them really knows what the other one's doing, but the mind puts them together and produces this sound. And if we go up and down, it has a certain sound to it. If I do the other relationship from the C to the B, it's a different relationship. So relative pitch is really a discovery about how our own mind works, how it interprets the sounds that it hears. Ear training is universal. It doesn't make any difference whether we're rock, classical, jazz, pop, country, oriented, whatever style we play, or whatever instrument we play, whether it's piano, guitar, oboe, violin, synthesizer, it doesn't make any difference. Ear training is the one topic where all musicians can come and sit together and enjoy themselves. Because whether we're playing rock or classical or jazz, we're still dealing with the same scale, the same chromatic scale. We all have C, C sharp, D, E flat, E, F. They're all the same tones. A jazz person may put together certain chords a little differently than maybe a classical person would. But they're all the same tones, and we're all dealing with how the ear interprets sound. We all must have the ability, our ears must have the ability to unlock the sound that it hears. Now, when we say unlock, that means if you have three tones like that, the ear has to have the ability to get inside each one of those sounds. Most people only hear the top note, the C on top. I remember when I uh, was trying out for concert choir at a conservatory that I attended. You may wonder why I even was trying out for concert choir when you hear me sing a little later. But the thing is, I was trying out, and one of the, the drills that he had everyone do, he played a chord like that, and he said, now sing me the middle note, because he was trying to test to see if the ear was open enough to be able to unlock the sound of that chord, to get inside of it and hear the middle tone and hear the bottom tone. So this is what we mean when we talk about unlocking a chord. The ear should not just hear the top note. If you have a thing like this, everybody hears, but we have to also be able to hear, and then when we can hear them together, the ear is really hearing. So I sat next to, when was this? I don't know. like earlier this year, maybe sometime last year, or something like that, sometime after September, maybe in September, I don't know, I sat next to, um, yeah, in September, I sat next to a uh, um, person on a bus who was going, or not on a bus, on the Amtrak, so this was like, you know, in September, pre, pre-COVID era, and um, he, uh, he was really interesting, and he was going to go play in this, um, um, this uh, big competition. And he was like one of like the only like Americans that were invited to do this in New York City and things like that. And so it was like really good. And uh, so he had me like listen to like Mozart and things like that. And he was just like, do you hear that? And it was like the same way he heard piano, which I had never heard about it before. He was like, do you hear the way the music flows and everything like that? It's like the same way I think of singing, like when I hear a song or when I hear it in my head. So I just found that so interesting. It was the first time I realized that like, oh, when people play instruments and stuff, it's like they hear that the way I hear somebody singing. Like I might not really hear the music, but you know, like I'm, you know, becoming like more attuned to the music and learning beat and kind of that stuff. But I'm more like the singing the words and things like that. But just like I hear the voice, he hears the music and he hears the different tones and stuff. Um, kind of like what he's talking about. And so like, you know, he was like a really, really great um uh, player, piano player, instead of pianist, and uh, so yeah, that's anyway, that's just what that made me think about. Hearing what it's listening to. Two people can hear the same music, the same song on the radio, the same symphony, but they can hear it completely differently. One person hears very deeply. His ear unlocks all the cores. It understands what's going on. Everything is in focus. The other ear is certainly able to enjoy, but if it doesn't really penetrate deeply into the music, then its appreciation is more limited. If you're a performer, 
you certainly can only perform as well as your ear can hear. If you're a classical musician and you're playing a fugue, you have to be able to get inside the music to bring out the voices that are inside. We talked about this at the Perfect Pitch seminar. It's the same as when you're a composer. You could be a rock composer, jazz composer. It doesn't make any difference. Your ear can only think up and compose what it can comprehend. And it's the same as when we're listening. You can only enjoy as much as the ear can hear. It's sort of like if you go to a museum and you're looking at all the beautiful classical pieces of art. Maybe there's modern art and there's more classical art like Van Gogh, all the, the well-known painters. Now, anybody off the street can go in and enjoy that art, the beautiful colors and, and, and the beautiful portraits and paintings that these great artists have achieved. But if you study art, if you yourself are an artist and you go in and you can be appreciating the different brush strokes and how the artist worked with light and dark and how he mixed his colors and how he did all these other art techniques, then you can appreciate the art even better. Greater knowledge will give a deeper appreciation and also a greater skill in art itself. It produces more skill and this is the same in music. When we have a broader musical awareness, it will produce more skill when we are actually performing, when we're actually playing. So because music is a hearing art, everything in music is completely and utterly dependent upon how well the ear hears. There's two kinds of musicians. There's the kind that recognizes the value of ear training and they go after it and improve their ear and then improve everything they're doing. And there's also the kind that really don't understand the need to improve one's own self. Sometimes we get people that are more intellectual, they take a more intellectual approach, and they will go out and buy a lot of equipment, maybe a special synthesizer or, or advanced programs or uh, more mixers, different kinds of gizmos, all kinds of things that you can use to improve the state of the art of music. Now, this is very good. All these electronic devices are certainly going to help what you can achieve with music, but no matter what material possessions we own as musicians, it will never make up for what we are as musicians. Our own awareness is going to be the limiting factor. If the awareness is narrow, then the music that we put out, no matter what equipment we have, will not be as great. But if the awareness is broad, the ear hears very deeply, then it increases what our potential is. I was very fortunate to have an incredible teacher, Helen Vinograd, who was very aware of the need for opening up the ear as soon as possible. I remember when I first was going to her and I was playing classical pieces and I think I was playing Mozart or something and she said, well, you know, it was supposed to be a C sharp there and you played a C natural. Didn't you hear that? And I said, no, I, I didn't hear that. And then a little while later, she said the same thing. She said, no, you did it again. You played C natural. It should have been C sharp. And I said, oh, but she goes, didn't you hear that? Didn't it sound wrong to your ear? And I said, no, I really didn't notice it. She told me that you really do have a good ear, but it's just closed. It needs to be opened. It's sort of sleeping. So she very promptly sent me off to the local music school. And she said that they would do ear training exercises and that would open up the ear. And of course it did. It's a wonderful thing to do simultaneously to taking music lessons or practicing music, even if you don't take music lessons, to, just to do ear training. Ear training is really like plowing the field. If you have a field and you want to grow certain crops in it, it doesn't make any difference if you're going to grow tomatoes or corn or soybeans. Same thing. It doesn't make any difference if you're going to grow rock music, jazz music, classical music. You have to plow that field. Now, gaining knowledge about music is like removing the rocks from the field. Gaining relative pitch is like plowing the field. And gaining perfect pitch is like fertilizing the field. Now, you can try to make music without doing anything to the field, but things will not grow if it's rocky. It will not grow as well if it's not plowed. It won't grow as well if it's not fertilized. We need to do all these three things. Buying equipment extra real expensive equipment which can do a lot of things is like getting a bigger field 
Certainly with more equipment, you can do more things. It's a bigger field, you don't but know what still to do with we have field. to plow it. Then we can do yeah. anything in music. There's just no limit. These are the two sides of the coin, perfect pitch and relative pitch. They're completely different levels of awareness. See, this might be an unusual concept, a new concept to a lot of musicians, but the ear has many levels of awareness. It's not that we just hear on one level. On the surface level, we have relative pitch, and at a deeper level, we have absolute pitch. It's not that you either have one or the other. We should have both perfect pitch and relative pitch. Now, perfect pitch or absolute pitch deals with color. We have 12 tones in the chromatic scale. Chromatic means colored. And perfect pitch is becoming sensitive to the colors of the pitches. When you can hear the colors clearly, then if I play this note, you hear that it's the color of a C sharp, you know it's a C sharp right away. Now relative pitch is completely different. Relative pitch is the awareness of space between notes. We call these intervals, the distances between notes, how one note relates to another. Relative means relate. Once again, it's an illusion. There is no space between notes. If I go from here to here, there's no space. It just sounds like there's a space. So relative pitch is the awareness of the distances between. Hey, Google. Stop. Hey, Google. Set an alarm for 10 minutes. 1.29 a.m. Set. Okay, that'll make it to the break between notes. It's a very different kind of awareness. Relative means changing level of awareness. When we're playing music, the intervals, the distances change. They just always change. That's how music flows in change. Whereas absolute pitch, absolute means non-changing. The colors of the pitches always remain the same. Here I have an F sharp. That has a certain color sound to it. And those of you who have already had the perfect pitch course will know what we're talking about. Every time you're playing a piece and you hit that F sharp, it's the same sound, same sound. The B flat always sounds the same. They don't change. The intervals change, but the colors do not. We're recording these tapes at beautiful Grand Lake, Michigan, and I'd like to use that lake as an example to illustrate what we're talking about. If you have on the surface of the lake waves, now the waves change, they go all around. The lake doesn't move, see? It just appears to have motion because the waves are moving. It's the same way with relative pitch. The notes don't really move, but they just appear to flow one after another because of this so-called illusion that we have. It sounds like things are going up. Nothing's going up. We're just playing individual notes, but it sounds that way. Now, this is relative pitch, the waves on the surface. Now, at a deeper level of perception, perhaps we can say that absolute pitch is like the different colors of rocks at the bottom of the lake. We have a green rock, a brown rock, a red rock, an orange rock. Now, those rocks will color the water, but they do not change. No matter what waves flow above them, the colors of the rocks do not change. They're different levels. Absolute pitch is a deep level. Relative pitch is on the surface level of perception. Now, this is why we said that to develop absolute pitch, we have to expand our awareness. Most ears don't hear these colors very clearly. So we have to open up the ear so it begins to hear these very subtle sound colors. And then we develop perfect pitch. Any note we hear, we can name what it is. Now, relative pitch is a focus of musical awareness. We don't expand the ear, we focus it. If we have a note here and a note here, we focus to see what the distance is and then we learn to label that distance. It's a focus of awareness. Now remember when we used that analogy with a television set? We said that if you don't have even relative pitch, it's like watching a black and white TV that's out of focus. See, relative pitch, we said, is a focus of awareness. So we have to focus that TV so we have a sharp picture. With relative pitch, we can enjoy the music 
if you're listening to music and you don't have relative pitch, you hear all these chords that are going on everywhere, but we don't really know what's going on. We just have a, a blurred effect of what's going on. Relative pitch is the focusing so that we can hear very clearly what is going on in the music. And then if we also add absolute pitch, then we hear the colors very clearly. Now, some people who come to the perfect pitch seminar wonder if relative pitch is all that we need or if absolute pitch is all that we need. Some people say, well, one or the other is all you need. And some people, after they've heard the perfect pitch seminar, then they say, well, all I want is perfect pitch. But really, the ear needs both. They both have their own ranges, their own territory, so to speak, and neither one of them can infringe on the other's territory. Command over musical pitches comes when we master their sound. Now, when we master the sound with perfect pitch, we have the colors in our awareness. We have mastered the sound of the colors. We gain certain proficiencies. When we master the sound of the relationships, that's the intervals, then we gain another set of proficiencies. They're both necessary. When we have gained command over musical pitches with perfect pitch and relative pitch, playing by ear and improvisational skills, they're advanced light years. When we want to take music off of records, we've got music inside our own head we want to put on paper. That's vastly accelerated because your ear has already done the work for you. You don't have to sit and fish around for it all. You have a constant head start over anyone who has to play them first in order to find out their sounds. When you want to play by ear, you know what they already sound like, the intervals and the notes. Singing becomes more precise when you can compute any pitch or any interval from memory at any time. We said in the perfect pitch seminar that the ear is really four times as powerful when it has both perfect pitch and relative pitch as with either one of them separately. It can guide the performance with greater confidence. They're both necessary. Relative pitch, we should make a definition of it. Relative pitch equals the mind's understanding of what the ear hears. This is very important. Relative pitch equals the mind's understanding of what the ear hears. important. This is going to be a stricter definition than what a lot of schools may define it. Relative pitch is the mind's understanding of what the ear hears. That means that if we have a space like this, we have to be able to know that that is called a major sixth. And in addition, if I tell you this is an E flat, you have to be able to tell me that this top one is a C. It's part intellectual and it's part perceptual. Relative pitch is more intellectual for this reason. It has to do with the mind and musicianship. Relative pitch is the level of musicianship, being able to have command over intervals. Perfect pitch is different. Perfect pitch is more to do with the heart than with the intellect, because when you hear the colors of the tones, it's not an intellectual experience. As a matter of fact, one of the common problems that I face regularly with students is they try to intellectualize the experience of absolute pitch, and then they can't hear it. So we have to get rid of the intellect when we're using perfect pitch. But relative pitch, we do use the intellect. Perfect pitch is the level of the heart, feeling these very subtle sound qualities, and that is the level of the artist, color. This is all having to do with perfect pitch, the level of the, of the musical artist dealing with colors. Relative pitch is the level of the mind dealing with musicality. They're both important because, the reason they're both important is because what's the difference between noise and music? Music has heartfelt intelligence. You can just play anything on the piano. This is, this is noise, it's not music. But when there is some kind of some kind of pattern to it, then 
there's heartfelt intelligence. There's intelligence to it, but it affects the heart. So when these two are together, that's when the ear is at its most powerful. Relative pitch gives the focus of the picture, that TV set. If you don't have relative pitch and you have perfect pitch, it's like having a color TV set, but it's not in focus. You can see the colors, but the picture isn't clear. See, when you have relative pitch, you're listening to the music and all the chords and how they relate, it's clear. It makes sense to the ear. Let me show you what I mean here. We can have two different notes. Let's take a C and an E. Now, together, they make a certain sound. They have certain colors to them. With absolute pitch, the C has one color, the E has a different color. Now, I'm going to take those two notes and I'm going to change them. I'm going to put one above the other. I'm going to put the E on the bottom and the C on the top. Now, look, they're the same notes, but now the sound has changed. Here's the first way. Second way. You see, they're the same colors as far as perfect pitch is concerned, but they're different sounds as far as relative pitch is concerned. This is why relative pitch is always necessary. Perfect pitch will never make up for not having relative pitch. Let me show you a magic trick here. If I have a musical scale, Whoops. Now, if I just stop there, what happens? What does your ear want to do? Relative pitch tells you that it just wants to somehow go to the... Stop. All right. That was the whole hour. We took some notes. Yeah. Um, we drew a little bit, but I can't draw. So it's just if I didn't really have anything to say, um, I guess I'll give my thoughts. Like I said, I'll get better at this whole commentary thing. Is you know I'm also listening and stuff, and uh, you know he's kind of good in that he doesn't take too long to get to the point. So like things that I would say, like right afterwards, he talks about it. So that's good, and about like the exact definitions and not and you know different things that I say. And so I don't know if it enhances it or not, but. Well, that's a way that could be more exciting, I guess, to watch. If you have any suggestions, leave them down in the comments below. Thank you to whoever gave this video a like as well. Sorry for the interruptions. And, um, yeah, we're going to this is special July series, so we'll be back tomorrow night. Um, the phone will be charged earlier. Uh, we, we'll probably be back before 9 o'clock. Because, um, you know, karaoke live. So we'll do pitch training probably first before karaoke live. And then do something for karaoke live. Whether it might be a pre-recorded video. Um, I'm just not sure uh, yet about singing. Um, that's why I have this ice pack here. Um, so I'm still on an ibuprofen Tylenol uh, mix. Um, but yeah, so we'll see. And uh, thank you guys so much for joining. Don't forget to hit that subscribe if you want to follow this journey. Uh, Perfect Pitch Training, special July series. I think that sounds cool. Um, and uh, yeah, see y'all tomorrow.